This week's number, 273%. That's how much tequila and mezcal sales have grown in the last 20 years. But you know what they say about tequila? I don't remember. And I'm shaking and think I'm going to throw up. Welcome to Prop G Markets. Today, we're discussing bank earnings and ETF for options trading and fractional jet ownership. Here with the news is Prop G media analyst and recent visitor to London that blew me off, too cool for school, doesn't want to hang out with his boss, just signs the backs of the checks that I signed the front of, which is Latin for you're supposed to be nice to me, Ed. <laughs> Ed Elson. Ed, what's the good word? Well, you're coming to New York this weekend. I just checked your calendar. So you want to hang out in my hometown? I'm busy. I'm busy. Oh, okay. I'm there for a day. I'm actually breaking up the trip. I'm going out to the West Coast. And at my age, if you cross too many time zones, midair, you can slip and break a hip. And so I break up the trip. I go into New York, go to my pad. I'm going to see actually my sister. Maybe hook up with my posse, which is Netflix and edibles on my couch. And then the next day, I fly out to, I'm going to a conference in Napa Valley. And then from Napa Valley, I am in a conference for two days. And then I go meet some college buddies in Las Vegas at the Sphere to see you too, which I'm very excited about. Nice. And then I'm in Vegas for two days. And then I go to LA for Halloween weekend, where I am going as um deadpool but deadpool after the fire i have someone who's going to come put scars on me because i've been told i look like um, ryan reynolds right it, no but it's never just you look like ryan reynolds it's like you look like ryan reynolds after the fire or you look like ryan reynolds uncle but Disease, anyways yeah that's my that's how much, my how much do those sphere tickets cost by the way um have varying I, reports I think they're about four six. Well, I got the tickets. I got. I think they're like four six hundred bucks a pop. Um, it's so it's not as much as I think. Oh, really? Um, it's. Uh, it looks just. I mean, I've heard nothing but rave reviews, and I heard some people actually take. Uh, not that I would know. I hear some people take hallucinogens or mushroom chocolates before seeing it. So um, uh, you know, they um, make per day. They make half a million on ads. Just you just. Sign an ad sponsorship, running running an ad. Put that really? thing on the on the dome. That's half a million right there. Such a good idea. Wow, it's it's really innovative. It's I think it's arguably going to win. I don't know, most innovative circular the Webby Award venue. for best building for venue. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, what the fuck is with the Webby Award? We were ninety ten, and then we end up with a silver. And I understand what that means. Un- Daddy, unbelievable. Daddy wants his award. Like, yeah. where do I accept? Where do I mean? I don't get it. Anyways. Yeah, no, I, the, the whole thing's broken because we got a silver award, apparently. And then I look at our competitors and they also got a silver award. With a fraction and of the in, votes. The day, before, the day before they announced the award, we were at 90 and they were at five and five. So no, I'm the going signal on strike. kind of screwed us on that front. I'm, cool. I'm going on. Thanks to everyone who voted for us anyway. It, yeah. No. It means a lot. <laughs> yeah, we're very excited. Anyways, <laughs> what's in the news? What's going on? Let's start with our weekly review of Market Vitals. The S&P 500 declined, the dollar was stable, Bitcoin rose, and the yield on 10-year treasuries climbed back to a 16-year high. Shifting to the headlines. Health insurance premiums for families in the U.S. rose 7% this year to an average of roughly $24,000. That increase has accelerated from last year when costs rose about 1%. NVIDIA shares fell nearly 5% after the U.S. government announced it would restrict AI chip exports to China. Still, the company is up about 200% this year. OpenAI CEO Sam Altman said the company is generating revenue at a rate of $1.3 billion per year. For context, OpenAI's total revenue last year was $28 million. Tesla reported third quarter results that missed on both revenue and earnings. That hasn't happened since 2019. The stock dropped 7%. Meanwhile, Netflix beat expectations on revenue and earnings and reported a surge in third quarter subscribers. The company also announced price hikes for its basic and premium plans and lifted its free cash flow forecast for the year. The stock rose more than 15% after that news. Scott, reactions? 
So in the UK, they spend about 6,500 bucks per person for healthcare. In the US, we spend almost double that. I think it's about 12 and a half K. And despite that, people live longer in the UK, are less obese and less depressed. So in some, US healthcare could best be described as one might describe San Francisco, expensive but bad. Um, US <laughs> healthcare is just such a shit show. And uh, I do think it comes back to the fact that the insurance industry is in the middle. Insurance takes 45%, 45% of all, 45 cents on the dollar that goes to insurance ends up with profits and administration. And even if you have an inefficient government, they're not gonna get a 45% bogey. It's all gonna ideally end up back in uh, patient delivery. And so it's just the health insurance and the health lobby, it just continues to soak people. I mean, I think I told you, I don't have health insurance or I didn't have it for a while because if you can afford not to have it, you shouldn't have it. It's also another transfer of wealth from the young to the old because old people, uh, insurance companies actually, I believe, lose money on. And young people, people like you, you need to go to the doctor about once every 10 years. You know, you don't need a colonoscopy. You're not going to have a baby. Not that there's anything wrong with that if you decide to have one. But it's just, there's no, your health care your healthcare costs are nil. Occasionally, you want someone to give you an IV after drinking too much, but that's not really health care. And, you know, you go in and get tested for STIs every once in a while. But other than that, health care means nothing for young people and or most young people and old people need a shit ton of it. So yeah. it's both a tax on the American public and a tax and a transfer of wealth for young people yeah. to the, old people. The other interesting thing is that I was thinking, the, the other question that I was asking after seeing this news is, why is this happening now? You know, why didn't insurance costs rise 7% last year when everything else was rising 7%? And then the, the answer that I learned was that basically in some areas of the economy, it takes a long time for inflation to take effect. And what happened here was the hospitals and the insurers only negotiate their fees every few years. So you had all these hospital providers like HCA and McKesson and all these guys who saw their costs rising in 2021 and 2022, but they couldn't immediately pass on those costs to the consumer until they negotiated their contracts with the insurance companies. And that happened in 2023. So only now are healthcare consumers feeling that pain. And it feels like the next question you have to ask is, are there any other sectors that are, suscept that are susceptible to this sort of inflation lag? And if, if there are, there probably are. It's entirely possible that the effects of inflation haven't fully come due yet and, and that there's potentially more pain ahead. And if that's true, it would ultimately lend itself to your prediction, which is that, you know, you have a suspicion that a recession's on its way. Yeah, it definitely feels mostly because every economist says we're going to have a soft landing. Um, I mean, if there has ever been a uh, an ignorance of crowds, it's with economists um, or lack of wisdom of crowds. Um, but look, this is this is um, uh, U.S. healthcare continues to be. I, I just. I loved it when Amazon started coming forward with their acquisition of One Medical. And insurance companies, if you look at the profits of insurance companies every year, they just go up. I mean, they're just, the healthcare providers, I would argue, you know, it's a good job, still a good job, depending on what type of healthcare provider. If you're a pediatrician, it's a shitty job. If you're a cosmetic dermatologist, it's an amazing job. But, um, and then the admin and support staff and the nurses, they're well compensated, but I would argue... Um, I don't want to say the word fair, but they work exceptionally hard. Um, so, and the whole industry did an incredible job through COVID, I think, up and down the supply chain. But it continues to be, U.S. healthcare continues to be a perfect example of how lobbyists figure out a way to get in between the consumer and the provider and weaponize government, create all sorts of regulations such that insurance companies and hospital systems can get in the middle and charge um, unfair rents. And the end result is consumers and uh, pay too much. And there's no, one of the really negative things about healthcare is that when you're not paying directly for services, there's no watchdog. And that is you might decide, you might go in, you know, you check your bill at the restaurant. Most people check when they get a bill, they check it. No one checks their bill at healthcare. They assume one, these people are gods and we're not supposed you to ask. You check your bill at the restaurant? I don't believe that. Well, I don't. <laughs> but. <laughs> But most people do, right? <laughs> um, but 
yeah, that's not true. Did I check my? Yeah. Anyways, it doesn't matter. So, but no one, there's no one. Consumer scrutiny, consumer vigilance is a key to keeping prices down. And there's very little consumer vigilance because people assume it'll be insurance or they don't understand their billing. So I'm, I'm actually really, I think the U.S., the U.K. healthcare system, I believe, is actually uh, far superior. Uh, NVIDIA, you know, Aswat Demoner kind of summarized it. He said, unless NVIDIA finds another category as big as AI and owns it the way they own AI, um, it's overvalued. So I think this is beginning to rationalize. The valuation is beginning to rationalize. Uh, Tesla. This is a pretty serious slowdown. The revenue growth slowed to 9% from 64% last year. Gross margins declined from, to 18% from 25%. So what is that, like a 25% reduction in margins? And Musk um, said about the, or cautioned about the Cybertruck or optimism around the Cybertruck. Open quote, I mean, Cybertruck is, yes, I mean, we dug our own grave with Cybertruck. Nobody, generally, everybody digs a grave better than themselves. I don't know what he means by that. I don't. I think the Cybertruck is so strange looking, but maybe uh, uh, the whole thing, uh, you know, I don't I don't entirely get it. The, the multiple is coming down, but still enterprise value to EBITDA on Tesla is 43x versus Ford and GM at 7 and 5x and BMW at 4x. So we'll see, but the, the road is littered with people who underestimated uh, Tesla. The, well, the, the other thing he said is that Cybertruck reservations are off the charts. He said that there are there are more than a million Cybertruck reservations. Um, in addition to all the kind of crazy stuff he was saying about digging a grave, the thing that's weird is you look at Tesla's customer deposit numbers, and it's actually down nearly twenty percent from a year ago. So the thing that I'm thinking is like how how could deposits for the most hyped car in the entire fleet be off the charts, while deposits overall are down? Um, and I think it's just down to this fundamental lack of professionalism that comes with these earnings every time. The big news is that they finally announced their delivery date for November 30th for the Cybertruck. Um, but who knows with this guy? I mean, it was it was unveiled in 2019. It was supposed to launch in 2021. We've had like five different estimated delivery dates for this thing, and none of them have come true. So I think the thing that I'm taking from this Cybertruck event is like November 30th delivery date you know, take it with a, take it with a grain of salt. It's just, you can't, you can't fully believe anything that this company tells you at this point. Yeah. I would say when you say company, you mean Elon Musk, and that is you can't trust anything he says. And he doesn't, he doesn't feel any fidelity or any sort of, I mean, when we used to prep for earnings calls and the companies I've been involved in, we literally fact check the shit out of everything. Can we say this? And he doesn't seem to be bound by those same standards, but I think the story of the week um, is Netflix uh, adding 9 million subscribers in Q3 above. That's in contrast to the 6 million expected. So, I mean, that's that's an enormous beat. Uh, it's the biggest quarterly net ad total for the company since it added 10 million subscribers in Q2 of 2020 as we were all stuck at home. Shares increased 18% Thursday morning after the firm announced it would also raise prices for basic and premium subscribers in the U.S., U.K., and France effective immediately. In the U.S., prices for the basic service will rise by two bucks to eleven ninety nine, while premium subscription will rise three bucks to twenty two ninety nine. So basically, like a twenty and fifteen percent increase in prices, which really should help their margins, assuming that they don't inspire additional churn. And prices for the ad supported service will stay the same at seven bucks a month. Basic subscribers in the U.K. will pay an additional one pound sterling. One pound sterling. That's what we call it here, Ed. Or seven quid ninety nine, as we say here, ninety nine p, as they say. Executives noted that the cancel reaction to their crackdown on password sharing was smaller than expected. This company just has so much strength, and I'm convinced that the head of the Writers Guild, the head of the Writers, uh, the head of the WGA, actually works for Netflix, because <laughs> by forcing everyone to stop spending, it just became yeah. they all flocked to the place with the deepest content pool, which was Netflix. They found they they essentially ceded advantage to the one player that could cut their costs and develop a huge cash pile while adding subscribers because they could continue to produce content overseas. Yep. So they were able to rationalize expenses while continuing 
to add to their already insurmountable depth of content. And what do you know? They massively um, they beat on subscribers. Meanwhile, all of the other competitors who hire writers and actors have are, are come out of this thing a shadow themselves. So they have succeeded in literally uh, uh, turning the industry into a near monopoly. And that monopoly power is Netflix. And <laughs> I mean, it's just... And I'm 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 working with some writers right now, and they all say the same thing that they know a lot a lot of studios have basically not renewed the contracts with writers, and they're deciding how many they're going to they're going to hire back. So they basically the strike uh, it took money, capital, and strength from the networks and the traditional studios, and massively seeded it and transferred it over. To Netflix, they should have. The, the one of their demands should have been, "We want ten percent of the value that this strike is going to create for Netflix," and they would have made a, a lot more money. I mean, it's just. And then you want to talk about strength? They're raising prices fifteen and twenty percent off of an increase in subscriber base. So, yep. their volume is growing, their subscriber base is growing, and they're raising prices. I mean. The the analysts are looking at this thing and thinking, oh, my God, champagne and cocaine. And meanwhile, Disney's at a nine-year low. And so the strike was uh, Netflix could not have orchestrated. If they'd said, how can we massively increase our leverage, our profit, our growth, and our strategic advantage relative to our competitors? I know. Get the writers to go on strike for 100 in 40 days such that we can have a unilateral pause in spending for domestic production. We have international production. And then as an industry, you're seeing what basic economics would tell you. That we have an industry that's spending way too much money and is unsustainable economically. There's going to be consolidation. There's going to be cost cutting. And there's going to be price increases. We're going to see consolidation. Everyone is putting their cable assets in the front yard with a big sign that says no reasonable offer refused. You're going to see. Um, you're already seeing cost cutting. There, supposedly, the whole industry is going from 450 shows to 300. So we're seeing a 33 percent decrease in new shows, and we see uh, almost all of them raising their prices. So the the market here is rationalizing, but there's just no getting around it. Netflix ha- has is just pulled away, and there's even in you, what you see, you see an activist at News Corp. You see an activist. At uh, Disney, I think you're probably going to see an activist at uh, Warner Brothers Discovery. And meanwhile, Netflix is just kind of running away with it. 100%. Here is the most important and interesting thing that they sell on the call, in my opinion, that completely supports your point. Um, Netflix, Netflix said it's gotten a boost from older shows that it's been licensing. And the example that Ted Sarandos, the CEO, gave is Suits, you know, the show with Meghan Markle about the lawyers which first aired in 2011, bought the licensing rights to it, brought it back to Netflix this summer, and it was the number one most watched streaming show in the world for three months when it aired in June on Netflix. So that's basically the entirety of the writer's strike where they just recycled content at will. They were not at all beholden to the writers and the actors and their ability to create original content. And during that time, subscriptions up 11%, revenue up 8%, stock is up 15%. And as you point out, all of that and they're they're willing and able to raise prices. So massive, massive win for Netflix. So Suits, that's a story of a 40-year-old divorcee who saves a prince from the horrors of the palace (laughs) and royalty, right? Oh, wait, that's her real life. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to know what residuals Megan was getting while Suits was the number one stream show in the world. (laughs) <laughs> they want to know what color our baby's going to be. I mean, <laughs> what a shocker. News at 11 that that people in their 90s who drink tea and hunt stags on the weekend are unconsciously biased or racist. Is that really news? Is that really, I mean, is that, are we just, all right, let's clutch our pearls. Are we shocked? Do you like the, do you like uh, the queen and royalty and all that, Ed, given that you're from here? Uh, I'm like. I don't, I don't care about it. I feel like Americans are obsessed with it. I just don't care that much about it. Really? And I certainly don't care about Meghan and Harry. So that's why that whole thing just pissed me off. I'm like, who, why, do we, why do we give a fuck about these people? Yeah, I um, don't get it either. I don't yeah. get it. 
I like the fact that supposedly they're really good at cashing checks. Like they strike, they strike these multi-million dollar deals on Netflix and then they don't want to actually work. <laughs> yeah. That's my favorite. They're like, oh wait, we have to do something for that money? It's genius. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, I, I could be like them. Yeah. I'm going to marry, I'm going to marry Harry. <laughs> Let's move on to our first story. The big banks kicked off earnings season last week and overall the results were positive. JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Wells Fargo and Bank of America all reported strong earnings that beat expectations. This was mostly due to the positive impact of rising interest rates. As rates have risen, banks have been able to charge more for mortgages and loans, translating to higher net interest income. There were, however, two odd ones out. Morgan Stanley's profits fell 9%. The company cited a significant drop-off in investment banking activity. Meanwhile, at Goldman Sachs, profits fell 33%. Now, most of that decline is a reflection of Goldman unwinding its consumer banking efforts, which we've discussed on this program before. Nevertheless, that is the company's eighth consecutive profit decline. Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs shares fell 6.5% and 2% respectively. Scott, two very different pictures here. What is happening in the banking industry? It's not that exotic. The companies that shit the bed, if you will. Market dynamics will always trump individual performance. And while everyone wants to look for strategic missteps or management flaws, I mean, okay, it's pretty simple. If your business is largely skewed towards investment banking and M&A, you did poorly. M&A volume is at you know multi-decade lows. No one's going public because uh, we talked about this. The IPO market has become less appealing. And while there's been a bit of a thaw, I mean, Goldman, I think Mia pointed out that of the four big IPOs, Goldman was the lead underwriter for two and, and you know, co-lead on all four. So whenever there's a deal, Goldman is still the premier of the aspirational investment banking firm. But the market hates bipolar companies. And that is, if you had a company if you had a company that was doing 1 billion, 1.2, and then 1.5 billion in profits, so what is that? That's 1, 2.2, 3.7 billion in total profits, right, over three years. And then mm -hmm. you had a company that did 1, 4, and 2, a total of seven, the first company would be worth a lot more yeah. because investors don't like surprises. They like stability, they like consistent cash flows. And the reason why they love subscription businesses is they can kind of model out churn and what's going to happen with that business. And other transactional businesses are much harder to predict. Does Lululemon have the right merchandise in this season? You know, does uh, Goldman Sachs get a big, you know, huge M&A transactions this quarter? So Goldman is and Morgan Stanley are trying to move more into the wealth management business because AUM and managing the wealth of high net worth people is much more consistent. People generally don't leave. You know, their AUM and their market performance goes up and down. But generally speaking, I think they get between 50 bips and 1% of AUM under management. It's a nice, steady growing business. And that business gets a much greater multiple. Yep. The guys who killed it, are it's very simple. They're in the business of taking money into Chase Bank or Wells Fargo or into Citi or into B of A. You're depositing your check. And they take it and they lend it out overnight. Or if you want a six-month certificate of deposit, they give you, I don't know, 3%. And then they loan the money out for a mortgage at 7%. Actually, they're probably giving you close to a 5%. But where is that spread between what they had to pay savers versus what they could earn lending that money out? That spread was, you know, kind of call it, they pay you 1% two years ago and loan it out at 25 So that spread was 1.5 or one and a quarter has expanded to two, somewhere between two and three, the Delta, mm -hmm. which means their margins are up 50 to 100%. So it's just good to be Jamie Dimon or whoever runs Wells Fargo. I have no idea. And then if M&A volume comes back like crazy and there's a ton of IPOs, then boom, Morgan Stanley yeah. and Goldman are going to outperform the other guys. Yeah. The weird thing about this was, I don't know if you saw the news, I mean, so, so let me back up. Let's talk about some revenues here. Investment banking revenue was less than half of what it was two years ago and accounted for only 13% of revenues this quarter. This we're talking about Goldman Sachs, compared to 27% of revenues in Q3 2021. Uh, in contrast, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, and Citibank all have much more robust consumer divisions. For example, JP Morgan Consumer Banking Division accounted for 46% of its revenues and nearly 45% of its net income this quarter. 
Morgan Stanley and Goldman, both reliant on investment banking, as we said, have declined more than 10% year to day, and JP Morgan has increased more than 11%. Yep. And it, it, there's a bunch going on here, but I thought the most interesting story is DJ Soul announced that he is no hanging longer going to DJ. He's hanging up, yeah, he's hanging up his head, headphones. Anyways, I'm having a big birthday celebration in Scotland a year from this November. I don't know if you know this. I'll be turning 50 in about 14 months. Uh, and I have no joke rented out a that castle. That was a joke, right? No, it's not a joke. I'm actually 60. having a birthday party. I'm you pulling a Nancy Reagan. I'm pulling a Nancy Reagan. Just start <laughs> referring to me as 50. And naked, I look, <laughs> naked, I do look 49 and 7 eighths. Anyways, if it's dark. <laughs> so I'm renting out this castle, no joke. And I'm going to have a hundred. Uh, have you sent invites out yet? Am I, am I getting invites? I have. Week? And to be honest, you were on the list, but we only have room for a hundred and you came in at 103. That's ridiculous. You came in at 103. Anyways. I'm, gonna, I'm, if, I'm just going to find myself there anyway. If there's a lot of cancellations, plan on it. So I think this is so ridiculous that anyone gives a shit about him DJing. Uh, I just, I find, anyways, DJ Soul is playing at my birthday party next year. I can't wait. It's going to be Can't great. wait to see it it's going to when be I'm there. That's right. <laughs> Let me just make one more point, which is this. Uh, so first off, you, I mean, you mentioned the investment banking. The CFO of Bank of America had a great quote. He said, quote, investment banking can come back very, very quickly. It's just that we've grown tired of predicting when that might be, which I think is a great summation of the bipolar point. Um, but the other point I wanted to make is this theme of net interest income, which is the boon for all of these companies this quarter. And what is net interest income? It's the interest you make from lending minus the interest you pay out on customer deposits, as you mentioned. Now, the average annual percentage yield on a US bank savings account is currently 0.46%. That is 12 times lower than the Fed funds overnight rate. And you know, you'll say, okay, well, it's downstream of the Fed rate, interest rates aren't one-to-one. -one. There are a lot of factors. Okay. My response, rewind three years ago to, to 2020 when interest rates were near zero. The average APY on a U.S. bank savings account, 0.46%. APYs have not changed on savings accounts. In other words, these banks have collected all of the upside on the interest that they're receiving from the, lend from the loans that they put out there. But on the interest paid out to customers and customer deposits, nothing is changing. How is that possible? <laughs> it's an outrage. So, Ed, welcome <laughs> to capitalism where you have concentrated markets. When you have very few players, look at the oil industry or look at gas stations. When oil prices are up 10%, you can bet almost immediately you're going to see an increase at the pump. But when they plummet, they come down much more slowly. They're much stickier. And that's what's happening here. Eventually, they'll have to increase CD deposit rates. But right, you know, right now, it's Lollapalooza. It's like consumers, you know, I don't want to say they haven't noticed, but consumers were used to such low rates that if you go from point, you know, 46 bips to 1.46, they think, wow, that's amazing, despite the fact that interest rates have gone up 500% and they're now charging you 8% on a mortgage. So it's, and now some of that will close, some of that will be starched out through some competition, but it's probably evidence that the banking sector, is it too concentrated? I don't know. Some people would say there's probably too many banks. But the top, I forget what it is, the top five banks own, I forget how much they own. But this is a great time to be in the business of consumer lending. It's just uh, the spread. And by the way, on that, on that consolidation point, you might find this interesting. Uh, First Republic, which J.P. Morgan acquired over the summer, um, when JP Morgan broke out its earnings, it, it gave revenue and profit numbers, including the gains from First Republic and excluding them. And in this quarter alone, the revenues from First Republic were $2 billion. How much did they pay for First Republic? $10 billion. So, you know, they're going to make back what they paid for this thing in 18 months. And it feels like at least from my perspective, this is maybe this was maybe the best acquisition of the year. Uh, so I don't. We're not playing revisionist history here. If you rewind, we said that the guys who could come in and negotiate taking someone's problem child, 
this is like adopting a problem child and the government pays you $100,000 a month to look after this thing. You knew, you knew the bank that, you know, there was only a few that had the capital to take this thing over, that they were going to get it at a sweetheart deal with all sorts of guarantees and backstops on the, on the downside. Yeah, this yep. was going to be, you knew, you knew whoever got these things. When Janet Yellen called Jamie Dimon or whoever and said, can you take this? They said, well, okay, I will and I'll do it fast, but you're going to give me a deal that is so bulletproof because he's still paying, he still has, he's still taking Advil from the hangover of when they foisted Bear Stearns on them. Yeah. So they made it such a, look, we need to give the markets uh, certainty here and we need to get these deals done and we will basically give you a free option on these banks. I think the deal was if they lose money, we'll pay for the losses, but you'll keep the upside. And again, the interest rate environment has been fantastic for consumer banking and nobody and the run stopped. All the people left their assets in these banks, specifically when they were now owned by a company with a much, and it goes back to a theme that we've had here, and that is there's a lot of money to be made running into the fire. Mm -hmm. That when things are really ugly, when SVB implodes, that's when you wanna think about running into the banking sector. And all of these companies drafted down, even though they were still bulletproof, I bet their stocks, are substantially up since the SVB crisis. Let's move on to our second story. Last month, the first ETF to trade zero-day options launched in the US. What are zero-day options? Well, they're like any other option, except the contract has a maturity date of 24 hours or less. In other words, it's a bet on how much the price of a stock will rise or fall within a day. Now, in the past few years, these types of options have exploded. Zero-day trading volume now accounts for 43% of total S&P 500 options volume. That's up from 21% just two years ago. And this new ETF, known as the Defiance NASDAQ Enhanced Option Income ETF, is capitalizing on that. How is it doing it? By writing and selling zero-day put options on the NASDAQ 100. Put another way, each time someone bets that the NASDAQ will go down within 24 hours, the Defiance ETF takes the other side of that trade. And so far, it's working. The Defiance ETF has returned 1.5% since it launched a month ago. Whether that will last, however, is another question. Zero-day options trading was popularized by retail traders in 2021, and although it's attracted some institutional attention, it is still associated with significant risks. Scott, you've adopted a similar strategy writing covered calls, and we discussed that on our February 13th episode. What do you make of this zero-day options ETF? Well, the broader trend around same-day options is a little bit scary. And I think there's some systemic risks that I don't entirely understand. But it's tapping into this need for DOPA, thinking that time you know, will go slower than it does. The majority of the time, stocks don't move a lot during the day. They have to pay a premium for these things. So I think it's a really interesting product. I actually am drawn to this. And writing options, so what happens when you write an option? Someone says, I think Netflix is going to go down. And so trading at 410. So they pay a dollar or two dollars for an option that says, ah, uh, you have to buy it for me at 410. So if it goes down, you have to pay me um, my, you know, you have to buy a share for me at 410. And I got um, I paid you two dollars for that, for that put. If I wrote the put, I get two dollars in premium. Now if it goes to 405, I've got to buy the share from you at 410. Minus the two dollar premium, I lose three bucks. But more often than not, in a strategy like this, the option is going to expire worthless, and you're going to get to hold on to the premium. The way to describe this, though, is that your downside is fairly is almost unlimited when you're writing calls. I should say your ups, your downside is unlimited because technically the stock could go to the moon that day, although that's unlikely. When you're writing puts, your downside is limited by the full value of the stock, which is still a lot. So what this really is, is the right analogy is, it's like collecting dimes in front of a bulldozer. And that is, it's, a, it's kind of a low cost way to collect income, but it's dangerous. And what's happened with me sometimes is if I write covered calls against Airbnb, and I say, all right, uh, it's trading at 125 bucks, I'm gonna sell or write calls at 125 bucks that are expiring on Friday and I get $2 premium, if it jumps to 140, I have two choices. I either got to deliver those shares at 125 and go to the market and buy them, so if I, 
I'm out $13 per share, which is a lot, or I can sell my underlying shares to cover the cost. So it's a dangerous strategy, but when it works, it's a really high return strategy. Mostly, though, it's tapping into a few things. One, it's tapping into the option premium that's probably greater than the risk, as represented by retail investors who are horny for these things. Two, it's not really a part of the market. It's pure speculation. I mean, this really is Vegas. Yep. And three, um, it's, a, it's definitely a high risk high risk, high return strategy. Retail investors account for half of options trading volume. And then you compare that to, you know, just regular securities trading volume, and it's around 20%. So basically, there is for sure a demand and a hunger for these casino-like options contracts in the retail market that does not exist in the institutional market. Um, and there is also a hunger and a demand in the institutional market to sell those options. So, you know, if you're selling an option, there's a one in two chance that you're selling it to a retail investor. Um, and there's also a high likelihood that that retail investor is some kid who got into day trading during the pandemic. In fact, it's it's a 15% chance. 15% of retail traders only started investing during the pandemic. And you know, four, uh, two in five of them are Gen Z or millennial. So I want to bring up an ethical question, which is, it feels like the calculation behind this trading strategy is, do we institution think that we understand the market better than some kid who started day trading during the pandemic? Um, and do you believe that it is acceptable for institutional investors to be capitalizing on the inexperience, the impatience, and frankly, the addiction of retail investors? Or am I being overly cynical. So what the data shows is that there are more retail investors buying these things and more institutional investors riding them and selling them, um, which says the following. It says that retail investors are getting more DOPA hits here and institutional investors have done the math and said on a risk-adjusted basis, you're better selling options than riding them. You're better, I'm sorry, that you're better off selling or riding options than buying them. Now, as it relates to your question around the ethics of it, um, you don't have any friends on Wall Street. And a lot of people would say, well, Ed, all of these people who entered into the market is a good thing because we want more participation from mm -hmm. Main Street in stocks, which have been a fantastic way to aggregate wealth. Now, is this stocks? No, it's essentially gambling. And the fact that retail investors are on the buy side, a, a kid who has some money and is playing with Robinhood or same day options says, oh, I think, the Netflix earnings are coming out. I think next, Netflix is a great company. I'm going to buy calls that expire today, and I get to watch it, and it's fun, and I get a dope hit. That type of trading strategy usually doesn't work out pretty well, and you want to be on the other side of that. I have never, I don't think I've bought options in years. I've been riding them because my philosophy is the people looking for that dope hit are being, are being driven by emotion, and emotion is your enemy. And in this instance, I want emotion to be my ally. And that is, I think that the premium that people are receiving is greater than the risk. I mean, yeah. there's a few things. One, you have to have substantial capital or margin power to cover a black swan event. So there's a limited number of people who can write options, whereas anyone can buy them. Two, younger retail investors who usually are more driven by emotion. And there's sort of a, you know, I would argue that because there is unlimited loss on the writing side, people, a lot of people avoid them. So that all adds up to an asymmetry in the marketplace where there's more people who want to buy them than sell them, which lends me to believe that the premium the buyers have to offer a seller or a writer of the contract is greater on a risk-adjusted basis than the return they're getting, that you want to be a seller here or a writer of these options, not a buyer. Now, having said that, I have personal experience here. I wrote a lot of covered calls in 2021, and I made a lot of money. Again in 2022. And just to, just to clarify, your, your covered call strategy, it's very similar to what they're doing, except, you know, they're selling puts and you're selling calls. Yeah. Right. So I yeah. have... So, so I, you're, you're bearish. Well, what, it's not so much bearish. I'm trying to hedge. I have large positions in, in say, Airbnb, Lemonade, and Oddity. And in yep. order to hedge this concentration, if Airbnb is at 125 bucks, I'll sell calls at 130 
And if it doesn't go above 130 that week, I collect some premium. And I do that every week for 50 weeks and I collect some premium. And it's a way of sort of, the way I think of it is it's like owning an apartment building and that's my rent. Now, if the stock pops, as we said, to 140, I have to show up and I have to give somebody that stock at 130 and go find it at 140 or I have to sell the underlying stock. Now, technically it's not as risky because above that 130, you're just sort of net even because you own the underlying stock, right? So if the stock pops to 140, you have to either pay someone 10 bucks, the difference, but your stock has gone up by that much. You just lost the upside. Mm -hmm. Where you get hurt is you keep writing checks to people if the stock pops up and then it pops back down. So you end up with your stock that wasn't up in value, but you had to keep writing checks to people because it was volatile and it was moving beyond the kind of strike price. So I made really good money in 21, okay money. I made some money in 22. And in 23, I've been absolutely crushed because I've been writing calls and the market for the NASDAQ absolutely skyrocketed in the first half of 2023. So riding covered calls is essentially trying to get rent on your current options. It's a way of hedging, getting additional you know, cash flow from them. It's still dangerous, but it's not as dangerous because if the stock pops, you've just lost the upside because the underlying stock you've written the option against goes up in value. Uh, this is much more dangerous. This is riding naked options or naked calls. But I like the strategy, and what they're doing is they're diversifying. They're riding them against the entire market, so the black swan event probably isn't as, isn't as likely. But it represents another trend, and that is the market has really become more about speculation than financing companies. And I think it was Stanley Druckenmiller said that of the $8 trillion in transactions in the market every year, only about $300 billion goes to IPOs or secondaries. So what does that mean? That means what, you know, 95% of market transactions are one person betting the other doesn't know what they're doing and is kind of speculating. So the, the markets really haven't become a vehicle for raising financings anymore. They've become pure speculation. But I, I like this product and I think it's an interesting way to potentially kind of be on the, what I would call the right side of the trade and that is selling these things into dopa hungry retail investors. But let's move on to our third story. A year ago on this show, we discussed how the private aviation industry took off during the COVID pandemic. Today, one area of that trend in particular is still on the rise, fractional jet ownership. With fractional programs, wealthy individuals can buy a share of a plane, affording them a certain number of flight hours per year and the freedom of taking a trip at little notice. Meanwhile, the operator handles the hassle of managing pilots, maintenance, hangar space, and fuel. The price tag for owning one sixteenth of an average mid-sized aircraft, $1.7 million. Nonetheless, it's a price people are increasingly willing to pay. Fractional operators like NetJet and FlexJet saw a 5.2% increase in flights for the first three quarters of this year. And in the past four years, fractional flights are up 43%. Scott, you're a PJ fan, what do you think of a fractional PJ ownership? <laughs> so there's really kind of three basic segments of the market. The first is charter, and that is there's a lot of planes out there, a lot of operators, empty legs, owners who want to utilize a fallow asset, and they will put it into a pool and charter operators try and find buyers who are interested in going from Houston to Las Vegas and back, you know, taking their buddies to, you know, to see the sphere or whatever. And you call a charter broker and he says, I can get you there on a Challenger 300 and back from Vegas for 30 or 40 grand, something like that. That is actually economically probably the best way to fly private. Because if you're disciplined and you have a number of charter brokers out there scanning the market, you'll be able to get empty legs. A lot of times uh, owners of planes will break even or maybe even lose money just to get, put people in the back seat and make some money as it's being repositioned back to its home base or what have you. Then there is um, full ownership of a plane. So I owned a plane for several years, and um, that is awesome because the, the thing about charter is that, unfortunately, the worst thing about charter is you do the math, and you do the math on every trip, and you start thinking, do I really want to pay 30 or 40 grand to take me and my buddies to Vegas when we can just jump on JetBlue or American for 400 or 600 bucks a pop each? 
But when you buy an entire plane or you commit to a plane, basically you get, I at least for me, I did the math, I get 13 to 17 days a year at home that I otherwise wouldn't get. Because if I'm going to speak to the good folks at Kohler in Wisconsin and I'm flying commercial, I have to fly into Milwaukee and then get there. I have to go the day before and I can't get out. There's only one flight out at 3 p.m. the next day. I miss that flight. So I have to go Tuesday and get home Thursday. With a plane, I leave Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. I breakfast with my family, you know, get on my plane. I'm there, hour, two hour speech, and I'm back by dinner. So I've kind of saved a day plus. And you can do that all over the place. Now, granted, this is a very privileged position. A private plane really is a game changer in terms of time and access to fun that otherwise you wouldn't have access to. Um, I decided to sell my plane, one, because I got self-conscious about how much shit I was spewing into the air. Two, it's too much plane for Europe uh, in terms of flying domestically, everything's so close here, but it's too little plane to get along across the pond. And three, it was just so goddamn expensive. I, I think there's gonna be a list at some point of people who are you know, environmental terrorists. I don't wanna be on that list. Two, it was getting just too expensive. I make a good living, but not that crazy a living. And three, I got a good offer for the plane. Now, plane ownership, or what I came to realize is that full plane ownership is for the very, very wealthy or people who yep. are just hugely, huge enthusiasts. I think that fractional is the way to go for people who are wealthy and want to have a certain level of service and don't want to think about it, just want to write one big check a year. But the most economically advantageous way to fly private, hands down, is uh, to go out into the charter market. Are you going to do it? Are you the? Are you in that market? I'm always looking at it. I don't think I'm going to do it. I'm feeling not as financially confident this year. See above, I lost a ton of money writing options to shitheads like you who correctly predicted that Nvidia would go up seven million percent. <laughs> um, so I don't feel as flush as I used to. Um, and I just I don't know why. It might be hormones, but I feel insecure about the economy in 2024. I just want to be the guy that buys, a, you know, one eighth of a Gulfstream 650. And then I wake up the next morning and the NASDAQ's off 40%. Mm -hmm. And I feel as if we're due for a correction. Um, so I don't. Yeah. All right. Let's take a look at the week ahead. We'll see earnings from Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and Meta. We'll also see third quarter GDP data and the personal consumption expenditure index for September. Do you have any predictions for us? I think you're going to see, and I said this on Pivot, I think you're going to see an activist at Warner Brothers Discovery. There's an activist at News Corp now. There's an activist at Disney. These assets are becoming distressed assets. They're becoming fairly cheap. And the play is pretty obvious here. It's a good bank, bad bank play where you sell the cable assets. And I think the downside at this point, these are famous last words for a company like Disney or Warner Brothers Discovery, is is smaller than the upside. And I think an activist is going to come in and say, I want to keep tabs on this. I want you to cut costs. I don't think these companies have even gotten started with the cost cutting they're going to need to do or that they could do, quite frankly. Do you really need an activist to come in and tell them that? I mean, everything you say, I agree, but it's like <laughs> shed Very cable obvious. assets. Like it's sort of the most obvious thing. Like surely Zaslav is thinking about this. Um, I mean, do you think that you need someone to come in there and, and muscle their way in for him to do that? I think you'd be surprised. I think, for example, I think that sometimes, I mean, when Elliot came into Salesforce and they said, you need to cut yeah. costs. And yeah. they probably said, well, no shit, Sherlock. Of course we need to cut costs. We, we have a plan <laughs> yeah. to cut. We have a plan to cut costs. Six percent. I'm like, well, if you're growing twenty percent, you mean you're only going to grow your cost fourteen percent? I'm sure they came in and said, "Sharpen your pencils, boss. You need to actually really cut costs." And it gives them sort of cloud cover to do these things. Uh, they bring a different perspective. Oftentimes, these boards are full of what I call gridiron greats, or what I affectionately refer to as FIPS, and that is formerly important people who don't own any shares and want to make a quarter or a half million bucks showing up for free dinner every three months and thinking big thoughts about the future of software. Whereas an activist who owns a shit ton of shares, and I've been this guy on these boards, goes in and actually meets with the CFO and says, 
why the fuck is everyone in this room paying themselves $120 million in aggregate when your stock is off 30%? They, they'll start asking very uncomfortable questions because boards inevitably that don't have activists inevitably end up being your buddies from the country club or diversity appointments. And they're all just kind of there to be nice to the CEO. And CEOs are generally always the former fraternity or sorority rush chair. They're incredibly likable people. And I'm on some boards now where they do this bullshit thing called a pre-board call, where they call you and tell you what's going on. And then they ask you, they want to see what you're going to say in the board meeting. They're basically just managing you. And they don't want they don't want you to say anything unexpected in the board call or the board meeting. And it kind of actually really bothers me. So boards can get way too complacent. CEOs, especially in a company like a Salesforce, and Mark Benioff is a, you know, he's a god of software. He's a first ballot hall of fame. But it's easy for him to just get to establish muscle memory around growth all the time and yeah. never really say, all right, what would it mean if I laid off one in five of my friends? Uh, would anyone notice? And when an, a, an activist comes in and says, boss, you know, it, this can be your idea or our idea, but you're going to do this. And I just don't, I know these companies, I know, you know, I work with them. They don't know what cost cutting is. They think they're cost cutting, they're not. And I think that these guys are all inviting, I mean, two of the, two of the, two of the three already have an activist. And I think yeah. the third, I think it's going to be three for three pretty soon. I want to see you in your activist days. You need to put together a syndicate or something. Get, you think so? Get get involved. I'd love to see you just tearing these boards apart. Yeah, I think they mostly <laughs> tore me apart. I think they mostly ignored <laughs> me, and I left with my tail between my legs. Yeah. No, it like, who are you? It, it made for <laughs> fairly unexciting drama. My favorite was when I bought... I raised six hundred million dollars to buy eighteen percent of the New York Times, and immediately turned yeah. it into one hundred and fifty million in seven months. See above Great Financial Recession. <laughs> that was very stressful, Ed. That was very stressful. That was that psychic income makes you feel important, right? Yeah, that was and my, it's a good story to tell on a podcast. That was my learning activist investment. I did Gateway Computers. <laughs> I did United Retail, this plus size clothing company that was a huge success. No pun intended. Yeah. Um. I've done, I did sharper image. God, I'm dating myself. Wow. All these, all these fun ones. Anyways, we'll put yeah. together a group. If you get our numbers up, Ed, we'll go, we'll go after um, the Game of Thrones and Girls franchise known as uh, Warner Brothers Discovery. It'll Can't be, wait. it'll be Shark Week every week for the dog. It'll be Dog Week. <laughs> dog Week. That's, that'll save that, that Joey Bag of Donuts streaming network. Anyways, that's my prediction. A new activist at Warner Brothers Discovery. Thank you for watching this version of Prop G Markets. Check out our pod feed for office hours on Wednesday, and we'll be back with a fresh take on markets every Monday.